Solana is considered by many to be Ethereum's top competitor. This is primarily because of its unparalleled speed and massive institutional backing. However, Solana has seen its fair share of network issues over the last few months, and Sol has fallen far from its all-time high. This has left many wondering whether Solana's sunny days are over. Today, I'm going to give you a bit of background about Solana, bring you up to speed on some of the project's most important updates, and tell you why Sol could be on the brink of an epic recovery. Before we catch some sun, there are disclaimers that need to be done. I am not a financial advisor, and I don't plan on becoming one. I'm just a guy who makes educational content that's fun. Please contact a financial advisor if your crypto bags weigh a ton. Also note that I hold Sol as part of my portfolio, and I promise that no biased narratives will be spun. Now, if you've never been here before, my name is Guy, and when it comes to crypto, I always want more. That's why I create quality crypto content that brings facts and stats to the fore. Coins, tokens, news, reviews are just a few of the topics I explore. If you want to see what else I have in store, subscribing to the channel and pinging that notification bell is your only chore. If your schedule is being squeezed, you can use the timestamps below to skip around as you please. Just remember that sticking around until the end is the only way you'll earn your crypto degree. That's all you need to know about me. Let's see what's been going on at Solana's crypto beach. If you're unfamiliar with Solana, here's what you need to know. Solana was founded in 2017 by computer scientist Anatoly Yakovenko. Solana was built by Solana Labs, a software company based in the United States, and its development is coordinated by the Solana Foundation, a non-profit based in Switzerland. Solana raised around $25 million across various ICOs between 2017 and 2020 and raised an additional $314 million from various crypto VCs in 2021. Solana's mainnet went live in March 2020, but its blockchain is still technically in beta, and this is noted in the top right-hand corners of its two official block explorers. The Solana blockchain uses a novel proof-of-stake consensus mechanism that timestamps transactions using proof-of-history, a special verifiable delay function that's outside the scope of this video. Although the Solana blockchain has almost 1,700 validators, transactions are processed by groups of up to 150 validators called Solana clusters. Now, this relative centralization, plus Solana's insanely fast block time of 400 milliseconds, makes it possible for Solana to process between 45 and 65,000 transactions per second. To put things into perspective, this is about the same speed as Visa's payment network, and this makes Solana the fastest cryptocurrency on the market. Solana's endgame is to be faster than centralized stock exchanges like the Nasdaq, with the aim of eventually replacing them. And this is a big part of why the project is so popular amongst institutional investors. One of the biggest institutional supporters of Solana has been the FTX exchange, which uses Solana as its de facto exchange chain and has poured tens of millions of dollars into its ecosystem. Solana is also the official chain for the USDC stablecoin, though around 90% of USDC's supply currently exists on Ethereum. Like Ethereum, Solana is smart contract compatible. As such, it has hundreds of decentralized applications, and its DeFi protocols currently have around $5 billion in total value locked, according to DeFi Llama. Solana also has a sizable NFT scene, which should hit $2 billion in trading volume by the time this video hits the tube. This makes Solana the third most active NFT blockchain by trading volume after Ethereum and Axie Infinity's Ronin sidechain, according to CryptoSlam. Solana's ecosystem can be easily accessed using the Phantom Wallet, which exists as both a mobile app and browser extension and has seen more than 2 million downloads. All the buzz on the Solana blockchain has made it extremely large, which could quickly compromise its decentralization since a smaller and smaller number of validators would be able to store it in its entirety. This is why Solana stores its historical blockchain data using another crypto project called Arweave, and you can learn more about Arweave and how it works using the link in the description. 
Now, it's only been about four and a half months since I last covered Solana, but, this being crypto, a lot has happened in that relatively short period of time. Shortly after that last update went live last December, the Solana blockchain was hit by another distributed denial of service, or DDoS attack, which resulted in, quote, degraded performance. Now, I say another because Solana was hit with a DDoS attack in September as well, which actually managed to bring its blockchain down for almost an entire day. December's degraded performance marked the third time Solana's blockchain had experienced significant issues since its launch. The first time, in case anyone's wondering, was in December 2020 when the network went down for six hours. A few days after last year's December outage, Solana Ventures announced the establishment of a $150 million crypto gaming fund in partnership with Forte and Griffin Ventures. At the end of December, the Solana Foundation announced that the Solana blockchain had become carbon neutral thanks to the non-profit's purchase of carbon credits. Funny how that works. In early January, the bad news came back with a vengeance. The Solana blockchain experienced two back-to-back -back episodes of degraded performance, and I use finger quotes because users claim that this is developer speak for the full-on outage they experienced on all these occasions. According to the Solana status website, Solana actually had another two partial outages at the end of January, though it doesn't look like the crypto media picked up on these. That's probably because they marked the fourth and fifth times the Solana blockchain had experienced issues in less than two months, meaning that it was becoming so common that it was no longer newsworthy. Now, oddly enough, these episodes of degraded performance didn't change Bank of America's decision to declare Solana the, quote, visa of crypto in mid-January. JP Morgan also came out to say that Ethereum was losing NFT market share to Solana because of the high transaction fees on the Ethereum blockchain. At the end of January, Coinbase listed Solana tokens on its exchange for the first time, opening the door to more Solana token listings in the future. For context, Coinbase is known for frequently listing Ethereum tokens. Solana's Phantom Wallet also raised a whopping $109 million from various crypto VCs, giving the company behind it a valuation of over $1.2 billion. If you're wondering why Phantom raised so much money and why this could have huge implications for the crypto ecosystem, you can check out my Phantom Wallet tutorial using the link in the description. Speaking of Phantom, in early February, Solana announced the launch of Solana Pay, which will make it possible to pay for goods and services using the USDC stablecoin on Solana. Not surprisingly, Solana Pay will be integrating with Phantom and FTX. And because Solana seems to have the worst luck, a few days later, its wormhole bridge to Ethereum was hacked and more than $320 million of ETH was stolen. Now, if you're wondering how the hell this happened, the hacker tricked the bridge smart contract into minting 120,000 ETH on the Solana side without locking up any ETH on the Ethereum side, and then transferred the 120,000 ETH from the Solana side to the Ethereum side for actual ETH. If that wasn't crazy enough, a VC firm called Jump Crypto stepped in to replenish the ETH on the Ethereum side of the wormhole bridge in what Cointelegraph called the biggest DeFi bailout in history. In a follow-up interview, Jump Crypto president Kanav Karia explained that Jump's reason for stepping in was basically because it had built the wormhole bridge and was therefore obliged to do so. Now, to be exact, the wormhole bridge was built by the developers at Certus One, another crypto company which Jump Crypto had acquired last August for the explicit purpose of building secure infrastructure for Solana. Kanav also explained that Jump Crypto is confident that most, if not all, the stolen ETH will eventually be recovered, primarily because that amount of ETH is next to impossible to hide, and therefore next to impossible to cash out. To that end, Jump Crypto is working closely with the FBI and blockchain analytics firm Chainalysis to keep track of all the ETH that was stolen so they can freeze it if and when the hacker tries to cash out. Jump Crypto is even offering a $10 million bounty for people who have any information about the hacks. So yeah, give them a call if you know anything or know anyone who does. Luckily for Solana, the wormhole hack was quickly overshadowed by the release of the mobile app for Steppen, a crypto project on Solana that rewards you with cryptocurrency for walking or running. 
Stepan's novel Move to Earn Mechanics has caused the project to explode in popularity to the point that it cracked the top 100 cryptos by market cap. So, looks like I'll have to do a video on it at some point. In mid-February, decentralized streaming platform Audius announced that the audio token was available on Solana via the Wormhole Bridge, and all I'll say is, well, they could have picked a better time. Audius also announced the launch of Audius Rewards, which will airdrop audio to users who interact with the Audius app. Audius happens to be a Solana project I've already covered, and if you're interested, you can find my video about it using the link in the description. Anyways, in mid-March, the Coinbase wallet added support for Solana and Solana tokens, something which was arguably long overdue. In any case, it adds credence to the idea that Coinbase will start listing Solana tokens more frequently. Solana also announced that Solana Pay had successfully onboarded 600 merchants in its first two months of operation, which is not too shabby. FTX and CoinShares even partnered to create a physically backed staked Solana ETP, which listed on a German stock exchange. At the end of March, Wisdom Tree launched physically backed ETPs for Solana, Cardano, and Polkadot on stock exchanges in Switzerland and Germany. Grayscale also announced the launch of a smart contract cryptocurrency trust consisting of Ethereum alternatives, with Sol as the largest position in the trust. As the cherry on top, Ethereum NFT marketplace OpenSea officially announced it would be launching on Solana, and the integration was completed earlier this month. Then, another Solana headline from earlier this month was the Chicago Mercantile Exchange's announcement that it was looking at offering futures for Solana and Cardano. For those who don't know, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, or CME, is a futures exchange that's used almost exclusively by institutional investors, and the only two cryptocurrencies it currently offers futures products for are Bitcoin and Ethereum. Fun fact, CME's introduction of Bitcoin futures at the end of 2017 marked the top for BTC, and it's why I personally believe that the introduction of a physically backed Bitcoin ETF will mark the top of the current bull market. And yes, we are still in a bull market, at least for now. If you're wondering which cryptocurrencies will be the best to hold when the bear market inevitably comes around, you can find out using, of course, the link in the description. Anyhow, as amazing as Solana's updates, developments, announcements, and partnerships have been, Sol's price has been struggling over the last few months. This is for a few reasons. For starters, Sol is an altcoin, and that means its price action is highly correlated with BTCs. As you've probably noticed by now, Bitcoin has been having a hard time since December too. One thing that Bitcoin hasn't had, however, is an endless stream of bad press. The constant network outages and the wormhole hack put a dent in Solana's perceived reliability and likely resulted in many users and investors turning their focus to other Ethereum alternatives. Near Protocol appears to have been the primary recipient of these users and investors, which makes sense given that it seems to be Solana's primary competitor. Their blockchains have similar architectures, they use the same programming language, the software companies which built them are based in the same area, and they're backed by the same crypto VCs. More about Near Protocol in the description. Anyhow, I digress. In addition to these two factors, Sol's circulating supply has increased by between 20 and 22 million, according to CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap, respectively. Assuming an average price of around $100 per Sol, this works out to over $2 billion of potential sell pressure, assuming all that Sol was sold, of course. The good news is that Sol seems to have no shortage of demand drivers to absorb all this selling, if it did in fact occur, and not just from users or retail investors. There are over half a dozen different institutional investment vehicles for Sol, and from what I can tell, they've seen a decent amount of inflows since December, despite Sol's poor price action. A good example here is Grayscale's Solana Trust, which had around $10 million in assets under management when it launched at the end of November. Today, Grayscale's Solana Trust still has around $10 million in assets under management, even though Sol's price fell by 50%, which logically means that the total amount of Sol held by the trust has essentially doubled over the last four months. On the retail side, OpenSea's recent launch on Solana seems to have resulted in an uptake in user utility demand for Sol. One can assume that this is the case, given that the total value locked on Solana's DeFi protocols continued to decline 
during Sol's recent rally. As I mentioned in my last Solana update, however, Sol's massive market cap means it doesn't have much wriggle room to move to the upside in percentage terms. That said, Sol's price remains in a long-term uptrend, and it's one of the few cryptocurrencies that will almost certainly retest its previous all-time highs when the bulls really come back to town. Whether Sol manages to set new all-time highs ultimately depends on Solana's upcoming milestones. The first of these involves a Solana project called Neon, which is building a smart contract layer for Solana that leverages the Ethereum virtual machine. Now, I hadn't actually heard of Neon until crypto journalist Laura Shin interviewed Anatoly last November. She asked some pretty spicy questions, which I'll come back to later. According to Neon's website, its implementation of the EVM will be able to process 4,500 transactions per second, which would make Solana the fastest EVM-compatible cryptocurrency on the market. If you watched my video about the crypto developer report, you'll know that smart contract cryptocurrencies that leverage the EVM have an easier time acquiring developers and users, especially when Ethereum gas fees are high. Solana's Neon layer is expected to launch by the end of June, and when it does, Solana could start to take some serious market share from both Ethereum and other EVM-compatible cryptocurrencies like Avalanche. In plain English, Sol will pump. The second Solana milestone involves Circle, the company that issues the USDC stablecoin. Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire mentioned in a February interview that Circle is in the process of developing a decentralized digital ID protocol, which will presumably exist on Solana, given that it's USDC's official blockchain. In theory, this would make institutions more comfortable investing in Solana and its projects, and the investment that Solana's Magic Eden NFT marketplace saw after it implemented KYC supports this theory. Let's just hope they don't get too carried away with the whole digital identity stuff, eh? The third Solana milestone involves the Solana Foundation. In an interview last month, members of the Solana Foundation explained that they're focused on increasing Solana's adoption outside of the United States. The Solana Foundation is also working hard to onboard as many validators as possible and is using its massive treasury to bootstrap validators and staking pools. One Solana Foundation member made a passing comment that caught my ear, and that's that Solana is still intending on adding support for Cosmos's Inter-Blockchain Communication Protocol, or IBC. Unfortunately, no timeline was provided for when this will happen, but at least that means you have lots of time to learn about the IBC using the link in the description. Anywho, there's another milestone that might be on Solana's roadmap, and that's that it's vying to become the blockchain for the de facto central bank digital currency of the United States, which will probably be USDC. Now, I must admit that this is speculation on my part, but in my defense, it's an idea that was originally floated by multimillionaire investor Kevin O'Leary during the Bitcoin conference in Miami. In short, Kevin said that the Federal Reserve isn't going to be writing code anytime soon and that the United States doesn't need a digital dollar issued by the Fed because it already has a digital dollar issued by Circle, which is, again, USDC. Kevin believes that upcoming stablecoin regulations will turn USDC and other stablecoins like Paxos's USDP into de facto central bank digital currencies, hence why I used that term a moment ago. Now, this brings me to the potential concerns I have with Solana, and I'll start by saying that I don't actually believe Solana will become the blockchain of choice for a de facto CBDC, even though it's admittedly in a good position to take this title. This is simply because Solana isn't nearly as secure as institutions want it to be, and this is something that Anatoly admitted in a recent interview with Jeremy Allaire. This is obviously a concern because the implication is that, well, Solana isn't nearly as secure as institutions want it to be. And if the network issues continue, then it could lose ground to more secure competitors. This ties in to my second concern about Solana, and that's centralization. In that aforementioned November interview with Laura Shin, Anatoly admitted that the Solana blockchain currently has a single service provider. Now, as far as I understand, this means that all of Solana's validator nodes are using the same service to interact with the Solana blockchain. Now, 
To be fair, this is not all that dissimilar from how many elements of Ethereum use Infura to interact with the Ethereum blockchain, and I have a feeling that Solana has already addressed this issue or is at least working on addressing it. My concern, though, is that Solana seems to be having a hard time onboarding both developers and validators, and this is something that Anatoly and members of the Solana Foundation have admitted. Case in point, Anatoly says that building on Solana is like, quote, eating glass. And though he says it as a joke, Solana's development hurdles are clearly limiting the project's growth potential, and that is no laughing matter. As for validators, it sounds like the hardware requirements are insanely high, which makes sense when you're dealing with a blockchain that moves so damn fast. However, this also presents centralization risk, especially if the hardware requirements increase as Solana becomes more developed. On that note, I have a feeling that Solana speed depends on the number of Solana clusters, and this means that Solana is going to need a lot more validators to scale to its theoretical maximum and beyond. For what it's worth, Solana has no shortage of financial firepower to address these issues, and the fact that institutions have continued to invest in Sol and support the project despite these issues is proof that Solana still has serious potential. This is why Sol is one of my largest allocations, and you can find out how my crypto portfolio performed last year using the link in the description. And that's all for today's Solana update. If you enjoyed it, smash that like button. If you plan on coming back for more, subscribing to the channel and pinging that notification bell is probably a good idea. If you're looking for more from me, Coin Bureau Clips is the way to go. You should also check out the Coin Bureau podcast if you prefer audio to video. I'm also active on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, so feel free to follow me there. And while you're at it, join my Telegram channel so you don't miss a beat in this crazy crypto market. My weekly newsletter is where I share all the classified crypto info you need to improve your portfolio, and you get to see what cryptos I hold as part of mine, too. If you're looking for some of the best discounts and promos in crypto, then my deals page is where to go. Only for viewers on this channel, don't you know? You can find links to these resources in the description. Thank you so much for watching, my friends. It's time to bring this video to an end, but there's plenty more waiting just around the bend. My name is Guy, and you have been watching The Coin Bureau.